Bring them out, bring them out, bring them out, bring them out. It's hard to yell when the bat rails in your mouth. Come on. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. Bring them out, bring them out. Yeah. Bring them out, bring them out. Hey. Hey. This is what happens when Hilton is in charge of your walk-on music. Thank you all. I am Allie Merritt. I'm your MC for tonight. Welcome to Atlanta Startup Village number 66. Give yourselves a round of applause. You have braved Atlanta traffic in the rain. I'm proud of all of you. Thank you. You are devoted to the cause. So we have a couple of sponsors tonight. Who here has a beer and is excited about this? All right. We have two fantastic beer sponsors. First up, Kellyanne with Atlanta Tech Village. Round of applause for Kellyanne, y'all. Hey, everybody. I'm Kellyanne, and I'm the member success manager here at Atlanta Tech Village. We are the fourth largest technology startup hub in the nation. That means we have over 300 startups in our building and over 1,000 members. So if you're here tonight hanging out and you're like, hey, I want to be a part of this place, um, you should be. If you're an entrepreneur, you have proprietary technology, you should call the village your home. Go on our website tonight, check out how to become a member. Um, if you have any questions before you leave tonight, our team is at the back. Um, come say hello and introduce yourself. But thanks, welcome to the village. ATV has been our forever sponsor and we appreciate them. So we actually have a second sponsor tonight and we're gonna play a video for them. Hilton? <laughs> for ATDC. They are also a recurring sponsor. Can we turn around and wave to our lovely beer pourers in the back for ATDC? Thanks, guys. And I am told that for the startup showcase that you just saw promoted here, for the next 24 hours, you get $25 off the tickets. So go back and see the ATDC folks if you want more information. All right. So we have a couple other people to thank. We are live streaming this and also recording it. So if you are me, you go back and watch it every month and tell yourself what not to do again. Um, this is also thanks to our fantastic, also eternal sponsors, Pull Spark. If we can all turn around and wave, I'm going to make y'all wave again. Wave to Pull Spark. Thank you, Pull Spark. They have very kind, we're going to try that again with a better round of applause. I made you wa wave and clap. All right, round of applause for Pull Spark. I'm sorry. Thank you. They do this out of the kindness of their hearts. Um, and that also helps all of our presenters because they can go back and watch it again later. Um, and that makes everybody better. Okay. We have some amazing volunteers that you probably met up front when you were getting a name tag. All of their information is there on the back wall. And they get, in return for helping take down these chairs that you are sitting in tonight, 30 seconds to present. So can I first have Razor Digital up here? Razor Digital, come on down. Hello, my name is Emmanuel Green. I'm here presenting Razor, Razor Digital. I don't have very much time, but the basic concept is animated marketing. So there are a lot of startups and entrepreneurs here. We can pretty much create videos for your company at a reduced cost, at a reduced cost because they are animated. So this can be digital ads for social media. This can be explainer videos to explain your product or service. 
and we're a very modern, hip company that knows how to utilize the cutting edge technology with every social media platform, such as vertical video on Snapchat or Instagram. So yeah, I wish I could show you my video, but if you go to the website on the back, razordigital.com, that's razor with the Y, digital.com, you can see some of our work. Nicely done. And I have Amplified Concepts. Sherry? Good evening. I'm Sherry Heil. I have spent 13 years um, doing two things. I was a freelancer and I ran an agency. About two years ago, I decided that freelancers needed the same resources agencies have. So Amplified Concepts is a freelancer collaborative providing agency resources on demand for freelancers. That way they can take on bigger jobs. That way they don't have to say, yes, I can do that job when they really can't. Um, and for our clients, it helps us scale the project, whether you need something small or you need something large, we could accommodate you. Nice, I'm loving these 30 second pitches tonight. TEDx Georgia Tech. Oh, let's hear, we gotta start applauding at the beginning. What's up, everybody? So my name is Aditya. I'm here on behalf of TEDx Georgia Tech, and we have our annual conference on April 13th at the Variety Playhouse. It's going to be $50 for all of you guys. We're all professionals, and we're really excited for our roster. We have a CEO of a multi-million dollar skincare company to a leading international foster care expert, and you know many, many, many more people. So really excited to have you guys out there. So. Uh, our info is in the back. If you're interested, definitely come up, talk to me or any of my team members who are back there. And yeah, we hope to see you all there. Thank you. Eddie with Uplift. Come on down, Eddie. Hi, everyone. I'm Eddie, co-founder and CEO of Uplift. We help people overcome depression with our interactive digital program. 50% of people with depression don't get any treatment, so we started Uplift to fill that gap. We've run a pilot study that shows we're almost as effective as face-to-face -face therapy, and we launched directly to consumers just a few months ago. You can check us out at www.uplift.app, and if you're interested in learning more, you can come find me afterwards back there, or add me on LinkedIn. Thanks. And our final volunteer tonight, Joshua with Like My Shop. Oh, we gotta give him a second to get around. All right, round of applause for Joshua. Hey, I'm Joshua Hunt, and I'm here to tell you about Like My Shop. It's the simplest, easiest, fastest way to sell online. If you're trying to do a fundraiser, campaign, promotion, event, something like that, you want to push some brand swag, or you're just trying to launch a little sub-brand or something like that, um, no monthly fee, super easy, likemy.shop. Oh. Mic drop. He did actually try to steal my mic several times before the show, so he said he could get comfortable with it. So I'm not surprised he just took over the stage. All right, if you want to do one of the volunteer pitches and all you have to do at the end is put up chairs, you can go in the back and see Hilton. Thanks, Hilton. Um, that's all it costs you, put up chairs, super easy. Okay, let's get into the show. Are we ready to, go? ready to go? Let's have a warm welcome for tonight's first presenter, Culture Base. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very warm. So my name is Davion Zaire, you can call me Zai. I'm here to talk to you today about how Culture Base is bolstering local economic development and the joy of our communities using culture as an instrument. So culture is essentially the manifestation of our identities and our ideas in various forms from things like fashion, music, art, events, so much, so much more, right? Um, and culture is attractive. So a city like Atlanta actually last year generated over $15 billion um, from 53 million visitors uh, because of the culture alone. Over a third of this spending went directly towards cultural consumption. But there's a disconnect. When traveling to new cities, or even if you're living at home, um, you tend to do things like search on Google, the Visitors Bureau's website, and you find very touristy things that leave you with a perspective of the city that looks a little bit like this. But in reality, what really makes a city special are the subcultural happenings. Things like Cascade, God is Dope, uh, Deep End, where gamers gather every Monday night to play, I mean, yeah, woo, he knows a little bit about that. Um, but it's because of something like, things like Visitors Bureau, where they actually they do the best that they can, but essentially what they're purporting are images of things that are more corporate. So Coca-Cola, the aquarium, things that drive tax dollars back into their pockets, which we all totally understand, because we, you know, we kind of need those things. 
However, it leads us with the experience of having to go through hundreds of blog searches, spending endless time scrolling through feeds, asking people about what's going on, so on and so forth. So what we've introduced is the world's first and only app to discover and consume a city's unique culture using AI. And so essentially how it works is we actually just allow you to sign up, fill out a survey, and based on that survey and our applied ontologies that support our cultural AI, we deliver a curated homepage experience. And not only that, you can explore your curiosity further by exploring by culture, vibe, and mood within your city, the experiences and products. The result, millions of curious people begin to save time. Um, and on the other side, uh, millions of local creators make more money because there's more direct access to the market in the same way that an artist can now make more money on Spotify because they can connect to a listener that actually cares about their music. The market for this is pretty huge. Um, total addressable market globally is $260 billion. That includes not only the traveler's market, but also a little bit of the local consumption piece. Um, also, I mean, actually, you guys can read that part. I don't need to read that. So ways that we make money, we actually charge on tra transaction fees in a similar way that a platform like Etsy does. And we also charge a subscription for creators to actually sign up, upload, um, and actually be able to have an unlimited amount of uploads. In addition to that, our goal is to ultimately integrate directly with cities themselves so that we're not a competitor to the city, but any city can actually offer a culture base and say, hey, this is how you tap into our unique offerings and happenings to make their city more attractive and ultimately still drive more tax dollars back to the local economy, not even including things like ads. So what we've done so far already, our partner with brands like Tesla, Microsoft, AC Hotels, we've tested across the US from Miami at Art Basel to here in Atlanta to in the Bay Area and actually work with these brands to connect with the local artists and creative economy to build more of a platform for the locals while also giving more exposure to the larger brands. Things like channel partners that you see there are basically ways that we've figured out we can get to the market. Uber and Lyft are places where people always ask the question, hey, what's going on in my area? Where I can I find this kind of hat or these kind of shoes? Same thing when you get to the airport and so on and so forth. Um, and ultimately, last year, we generated over 15,000 signups with our initial, initial alpha testing. We also were able to gen, uh, earn over uh, $25,000 just from our initial tests. Um, and so what we decided to do is that's, that's what led us into the space where we had like that genuine feedback from those users on how to actually build something out along the natural lines of behavior of discovery. So this is basically my co-founder and CTO, Sam King, over here. He's an award-winning uh, researcher and uh, computer scientist recognized by the world's largest math conferences for his work on entropy. I am the former number one salesperson and trainer at Tesla, generating over $50 million in just as little as three months and continuing to replicate that success over and over. We're both creatives. I'm a writer and producer in the music industry as well. Sam's a poet. He'll drop you some lines if you're looking for him. Um, and yeah, I mean, all I really have as an ask of you all today is sign up, Tell other people, join us. We're actually doing a complete uh, relaunch of our platform late spring, early summer. So definitely join the wait list. And if you have any connections to the city itself, city officials, we would love to be connected so that we can talk more about how we can be of benefit to the city. And that's a little bit about culture base. I think I'm reaching time. I implore you all to embrace your curiosity. Thank you so much for your time. Questions? Thank you. So the question was, uh, it, it's a, it, was it US based or is it international as well? Currently we are US based. Um, the furthest we've tested is Puerto Rico. We've talked to people, like you know, we have friends at Google and Singapore and, and things like that. Uh, we realized that there is a demand. Um, we, we even pretended to be students at the airport, which Atlanta's the number one international hub as far as like air travel. So we went down there, pretended to be students and talked to people for a week just to learn about their experiences. And we learned that there is a demand for this, especially in countries that want to showcase more of like the, the local happenings. So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is how do we get the input that we're presenting to the end user? Originally what we did was we just built web crawlers and we were filtering that content. We aggregated all of it and we're filtering it. We realized that as great as that is, it's very difficult initially to uh, filter to 
have either just the right amount or I guess, how do I, it's both sides, right? It's either making sure that we don't have too much of unnecessary content or not enough of the right content. What we decided to do is go more organic. So we actually built out our network. So when we mentioned those 15,000 signups, those are people, at least a fifth of them, we actually engaged. And now these are people we've touched hands with. We know their products, we know their brands, we know their experiences. And so we have a referral model. So those creators then refer other creatives. We've actually learned that that's more effective because we can actually preserve the quality of the content that's on our platform. I got next. Yes. Yeah, so our relaunch is happening late spring, early summer. So definitely sign up for our wait list for that. Um, we're actually, actually I can't talk about how we're gonna do our launch, but, but yes, it is coming. The question was, uh, he looked at us up on Google Play right now. So he said, what's the plan for us to, for, for you guys to engage us? So I would say go to culturebase.city. That's where you sign up at the moment. Is that? Okay. Yeah, so in a similar fashion to how Netflix and Spotify curate, mu oh, how are you using, thank you, Ali, how are you using uh, AI to curate our content? That's the question. Um, so basically in the same fashion that Netflix and Spotify curate music and movies. Are you, are you all familiar with Netflix and Spotify? I don't want to just assume. Okay, cool. <laughs> Customer discovery right here. Um, so the same way that they curate music and movies, we're curating local products and experiences. So you sign up, we actually get a feel of your taste, and then the more that you do through our platform, the more we learn. Um, other cool thing about our AI engine is that it is culturally focused, so we actually have built out applied ontologies of things um, that even take smell into account of the area that you're in. How does it feel? What's the weather typically like? Um, because different people have different triggers for what makes an enjoyable experience. All of that is not going to apply at the beginning, but over time, as we collect all of that data, it's going to make a huge difference down the road. I love that question. Can I ask you a question in response to that? So he said, we're thinking about economic impact. He loves that. Um, but have we thought about ways that people can also be engaged with their city, basically, and volunteer and things of that nature? Um, well, in time, I'll just answer the question. Um, so we're a PBC, we're a public benefit corporation, and actually a big part of our model is what we'd like to do, is take at least like 10% of our revenue every year and reinvest that back into the community. So if you're a very active user as a creator or a consumer, you now also hold a stake in that 10% and being able to vote on where that money goes in the city. Um, and also by having a partnership directly with the city, we can do things like push notifications and say, hey, this kind of thing is going on. You know, those are things that have to be explored, theories right now, but, but yes, we, we really would love to. Yes. So he said, how are we different from our competitors, and do we have a different strategy for generating revenue? Our competitors right now, actually, I'd like to ask you all, what would you use in exchange of what we're doing today? Is anyone that could quickly answer that really fast? TripAdvisor, Trip great. So Airbnb, okay, also another great one. So TripAdvisor, I have five seconds to answer this question. Instagram Places, okay, can I, can I answer that? I know that, okay, cool. So TripAdvisor, I'll start there. Um, what we learned through doing customer discovery and also engaging people about TripAdvisor is they're not finding those subcultural happenings and things that are going on in real time. So you're not gonna find a fashion pop-up or a rooftop party or more of the locally engaged things on TripAdvisor. So that's one huge differentiator. We're really focused on authenticity of it being made by the people there. Um, so that's one huge thing. And your question was about our revenue differentiator. Um, most of those platforms function either purely based off of ads or promoted content, which also ruins the user's end experience because a lot of stuff is promoted, so you're getting the things that are promoted, not necessarily exactly what you want. And so we're focused on more, so that's why we're charging a subscription for the creators to be able to continue to upload, transaction fees on things going through the platform, and also working on hyper-localized ads. So these are ads that are actually curated to the area that you're in, um, as well as hopefully integrating with cities. All right. Yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Bringing it out strong.
All right, so some of you who have been here before know that usually this is the time where I tell people to like do a dance contest for swag. We're gonna do something a little different tonight. In this room, there are four chairs that have a pink post-it right under the front of it. So if you will lean down and take a look, there should be a couple in each section. Oh, all right, you've got one over here. All right, sir, if you will stand up and tell me. I know, this is interactive. If you will tell me, what is one thing that this community can do for you? The community of ATV entrepreneurs and Startup Village, what is one thing that this community can do for you? Help me find funding and a partner. All right. What, what is your business in general industry? E-commerce enterprise platform. All right. E-commerce enterprise platform. You heard the gentleman. Pair of socks to him for being a brave person for starting this up. If you found a pink post-it under your seat, don't worry, I'm coming for you next in between the next set of pitches, so hold on to it. Think hard about what this community can do for you. I have a couple more than just one pair of socks. All right, let's give a, oh, sorry, nope, we're still, we're still doing it, okay. I can tap dance or something? I keep saying I'm gonna learn how to tap dance. <laughs> Caitlin's gonna tap dance, okay. If you are interested in doing one of the five-minute pitches that you see up here, please see me after. We have three requirements. You have to be a startup in terms of age, size, funding. Um, you have to be based in Atlanta. That is a hard and fast rule. I am sorry. It makes people sad. We will extend that to, like, just outside the metro Atlanta limits, but we can't go as far as, like, Augusta. Um, and... Let's see, you have to have something you can pitch. That's it, this is not complicated, y'all. So come talk to me after. We're ready to go. All right, warm round of applause for Action Zone Video. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm not one to exaggerate, but you're about to see something that will change the world of video production forever, and it's launching here in Atlanta. Action Zone Video is an automated video production platform. Again, my name is Brian Hardy. Uh, it's been de developed by a team of people all over the world who are the best at what they do. But first, let's start with the problem. This is not modern, but it is called the modern video editor. It's called nonlinear video editor. You might have heard the term NLE, right? The first one was developed in 1971, and it replaced cutting video, cutting actual film, right? It was developed by CBS and Memorex. Today, that same technology runs software called Adobe Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, iMovie, Lightworks, PowerDirector. Do any of these sound familiar to anyone who's done video editing? If you're gonna do anything on Instagram or YouTube, you might start recognizing these names. So the thing is, the technology hasn't changed, and eight of these systems have controlled 90% of the market for over 20 years and they're slow and expensive. So kiss your weekends goodbye. Uh, you might see, if you do, just do a search on how long it takes to edit a video, you can see rule of thumb is roughly a four minute video it takes four hours to edit. Very typical, right? Um, and don't even think about the cost of the software, the training, and everything else involved. Why? Because it's software from 1971, okay? And it's also antisocial, meaning was Instagram around in 1971? was YouTube around. So it was developed before these technologies even existed, right? And we're creating technology, we're used, we have very easy um, distribution technologies around, but the production technology hasn't even caught up. So we wanna share things, we wanna be, you wanna share videos in groups, but why are you sitting alone in a room for hours in the dark trying to create the video for your friends? You should be with your friends, right? So Action Zone technology automates this process. It captures and combines video from multiple cameras into a single fluid video. Um, it automatically edits each video based on the type of activity it is, if it's a game or it's a lecture or whatever it might be. And then it also creates, it renders a full video at the end. This is completely automated and un, unattended. And then it also creates a timeline just in case you want to go back in time and use a nonlinear video editor. But it saves typically hours on production for even a short video. So, I have some demos. Would people like to see what we're talking about? Is it smoke and mirrors? No, it's not smoke and mirrors. 
So let's get into it. So first of all, with the help of Kevin over here who does pitch practice, you might have seen this guy, known him. We actually gave three cameras to people at uh, pitch practice last Friday. And we, uh, we actually had them go around and just record video. And then we ran it through Action Zone, right? We got about 30 minutes of video. I don't have sound, but the sound is pretty good. And let's see, are we not getting the video? The video's playing here, how do I get it run? Ah, got it, okay, let me get this. Can you tell me about the exit? Can I get three seconds back? Live demo. Ah, okay, so let me try to exit, <laughs> try to exit this. Can you see now, no? Okay, let me exit it completely then. Okay, there we go, perfect. So now we have, great, okay, so now we have this. So now we have these people, here we go. So this video actually was created automatically with three people in the crowd simply holding cameras and Action Zone tracking the action, tracking the speaker, and also balancing the sound automatically. 30 minutes of video. So by calculation, that would take about 24 hours to edit. This video was generated in about 20 minutes while I wasn't looking. So you see, it's a little, so that's literally what Action Zone can do. Now, um, so here's where we are. We're here looking for opportunities to actually pilot the technology. We appreciate Kevin and his help. We're also looking for people who are running major production, uh, production houses and using uh, traditional video editing technology. Because the one thing we can also do, and I'm gonna also jump back to that, is we can, just in case you wanna use a traditional editor, after it generates the full video, it also creates a timeline. So you can see here, there's the timeline coming up, hopefully. There we go. So this timeline was completely auto-generated. It's 30 minutes of cuts. And um, basically, as a video editor, this would save your weekend or maybe your week. So um, we're looking for, again, people to, to help but pilot it. And we're also op open to creating a, an app that will basically connect with people's cameras at an event and do the auto production for them. So that's the story of Action Zone. Appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, open to any questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's actually, it uses, uh, the question is, is this, is this timeline just for Sony Vegas? No, the timeline is actually something called an EDL. So it, it works with any standard editing package. So Premiere and Final Cut can all read EDLs. Any other questions? Yes. Pardon, say that, does, does the software... Does, does the software generate any graphics? So the, the software does not generate graphics. However, it does do cutting. Uh, it does, does do panning and zooming, right? So there's a feature there where it can actually track action, for example, for like a basketball game, right? We can actually have it track the plays. Um, but it does not actually do graphics. It's basically an editing automation tool. So then you get the exporting, Yes, which would save you how much time if you're not starting with a blank screen, right? Is your weekend back, right? <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. Yes? Right, so the question is, does the software take any, stand, any type of footage? So the answer is yes. It may take, it does take a little longer to process 8K and, you know, bigger footage, but uh, this video was all shot in 4K. So, uh, and it works with different formats, MOV, it, it's, it's, it's a standard. It also works with any camera. So you can pull it off of a DSLR, an action camera, your cell phone, or whatever it might be. Yes? Um, the upper limit, we've, is there a limit to the number of cameras that we, you know, that you can use? And um, now the thing is it gets slower with each camera, so, I think the limit we've gotten up to is around 26 cameras. So that covers most things. <laughs> yes. Uh, the question is, have we monetized this and are we generating any revenue? So right now this is a technology that 
uh, it, it has not been monetized, right? It's really just a technology that is, that's just hitting the market, right? And our goal is to really introduce it to people who are already have their own products. Who knows, maybe this could be licensed to a software company. Um, so we're really at the point where we'd like to be like the Intel inside for these um, video technologies. Yes? Very good question. Is this, is this, the question is, is this a, is this creative, does this have creative input or is it, so this is a pure automation solution, but the difference is it allows creative people to be creative. So my background actually, I did a lot of fight choreography, fight choreography production. I love to set up the shots and I love to watch the videos in the end. This shortens that part in the middle of the tedious workflow so I can get to the creative. The question is, how do you determine where to put in cuts? So because, uh, you know, I, it's a bit of an expert system. It's not AI, but uh, the, each different activity, we, we create a rule set. For example, like basketball is a different setup than some, something like a discussion with, with Kevin's group. And so we have profiles for each type of activity. It has computer vision built in, so it can do things like motion tracking. It can predict where things are going. It does have some intelligence there. I wouldn't call it AI, but it definitely is smart in some ways. Yes? The question is, is this the same technology as OWL? owl. Yeah, OWL, like a turning OWL, OWL Labs. Yes, actually, we've seen the technology before. So the difference is, I believe OWL Labs technology is in the camera itself. Right, so we can use any video from any camera. So we could probably use OWL camera. So for example, let's say you have an OWL and then you also have some action cameras. We could synchronize all of that and create a full video from not just from the perspective of the OWL, but from every perspective. Thank you. Yes. It's a great question. That's very technical, but that's very good. So he was asking about, um, okay, yeah, he was, he was just asking about, you know, is this, there are AI systems that are available, and then there are expert systems that, you know, we're using an expert approach. And, you know, are we, that is our differentiation, because we feel like auto, you know, race drivers don't want autopilot, right? And video editors don't want auto, they don't want full auto edit. They want something to take out the hard part, and then they can do the fun part. Right, so an AI, a pure AI system would take away the joy of actually creating the art. We still like to create the art, just not do the extra work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now you've seen what happens here. Who has a pink post-it that wants to volunteer and be my next person? Ooh, oh, all right, I got somebody down here. So in return for these fantastic ASB socks, Please tell me, what can this community do for you? You mean besides listening to my podcast? Besides that? I mean, besides listening to your podcast, but where would, say that was the only thing they could do, is listen to your podcast. Where would they find said podcast? Oh, they would find said podcast on Spotify, Podcast Go, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. What is the name of your podcast? The name would be dollars underscore and underscore cents. Oh, dollars and cents podcast. All right. Round of applause for this brave soul. Thank you very much. All right. When we're going to keep changing this up, I like to give away swag, but I also am really bad at throwing it and nobody really needs me to try to do that. So we're going to keep trying different things until we find one that really works. Don't worry. I have two more post-its out there. We are ready. So, warm round of applause for our third presenter, Tonic AI. Hey everyone, my name is Adam and I'm a founder of Tonic AI. Uh, Tonic AI is a dev tool that helps engineering teams create synthetic test data. Uh, before I get into why that's so cool, let me introduce the founding team. It's myself and three others, Ian, Carl, and Andrew. Uh, between the four of us, we have 35 years of experience in the data analytics space. 
Uh, I worked at Tableau. The other three gentlemen worked at Palantir as well as several other companies. Um, we're co-located in Atlanta and San Francisco, and we're backed by uh, X Fund and Bloomberg Beta as well as Heavy Bet Industries. Okay, so let's back to let's, let's get back to the actual problem. Um, basically, every company out there stores sensitive data about their customers, and they use this in all of their environments: production, dev, staging, test, sales, etc. Uh, there's a problem with this, though. As your sensitive customer data is in more and more environments, the chance of a leak or you know, some privacy issue becomes more likely. I mean, now, really, you can't go one day without hearing about some new company that's leaked you know, all of your sensitive data in some way, right? Um, and because of that, uh, companies are starting to feel like the pain from this, right? Like there's the, there's like the actual dollar pain of getting sued or being fined by the government. And then there's like the reputational hit they take, which might hurt like for future revenues. Additionally, it's no good for consumers. Uh, so because of that pain, companies are starting to self-regulate a little bit. And by self-regulate, what I mean is they're like getting a little more careful with how they handle sensitive data. Like maybe they're not using it in all of their environments, and maybe they're only keeping it in like their more secure production environments, but not everyone's doing that. Uh, beyond the self-regulation, there's actually government regulation, right? Uh, for example, HIPAA in the mid-90s stated how people could handle your medical records. You know, so whenever you go to a new doctor, they make you sign the HIPAA waiver release form, right? Uh, moving forward, uh, I guess two decades almost, GDPR happened last year in Europe, uh, and in 2020, uh, CCPA is going to take effect in California. Uh, it's kind of been labeled, you know, California's version of GDPR. Actually, if you want to learn more about CCPA and how it might affect your dev teams, check out tonic.ai's blog. Uh, we have a nice article on that. Um, so the kind of conclusion from all of this is that the laissez-faire days of data are numbered, right? Companies have to get more serious with how they treat their sensitive customer information. Uh, they have several options moving forward. Uh, the first on the left is open access, which is basically keep doing what they're doing. Uh, regulations and just like the way society is moving are gonna you know, stop that from happening, hopefully soon. Uh, they could just completely restrict access, put all of their sensitive info in super locked down environments. Uh, that can be very painful for everyone. Employees typically find workarounds so they can still get their job done, and it encourages practices of just testing in production and developing against production servers, and that, that leads to a host of other issues. Uh, a third option, uh, you can create a custom in-house solution using your own development resources. Like imagine some Python script that you know, takes the production data every night and moves it into a different environment, uh, but there's problems with that. It's difficult to make, or it's difficult to make well, uh, it breaks all the time as your like, data and your schema changes, uh, and it's just super fragile. And when it breaks, you know, everyone kind of is paused for the day until the new data gets refreshed. It can take hours to happen. It's just, it's not a good solution. Uh, but there's a better solution, and it's Tonic. Uh, Tonic is an automated platform for creating realistic synthetic data that is based off your production data. And when I say based off of, I mean it is statistically very similar and looks the same as. All right, so let's hop into an actual live demo. Gonna click. Okay, excellent. This is what the tool look like, looks like when you log in. I've already created a workspace for us just to speed this up, and I'm gonna go really fast. The tool does a lot. I'm gonna go fast, though. Uh, I've already connected to a database. It's a MySQL database. We support a variety of databases. Uh, this database happens to have two tables, an employees table and a, stub, a pay stubs table. This is obviously not real data. We'll just pretend it's real data. Uh, in this fictitious company, there's an employees table where each row is one of the employees. Uh, this table happens to have a lot of PII, first name, last name, gender, SSN, email, uh, what city you work in, how much you make, et cetera, right? So let's start masking data. And the goal here is to mask the data, but make it look like the production data. So I'm gonna start off with salary. Uh, I'm gonna basically create a new salary distribution that statistically is the same as the old, uh, but it's random numbers. Uh, I'll do the same with bonus. And then obviously, as your salary is higher, your bonus is typically higher. So if we want the system to generate, you know, a, a a distribution of salary and bonus that together look like the old data, we'll link them together, and that creates like a two-dimensional distribution whose like statistical properties are the same as the real two-dimensional distribution. Uh, then we have to go through every column and do the same thing, but we have detect generators, which will do it for you. Uh, typically, you'll want to review the output of this to make sure everything works, and then once you've done this, it'll take a few seconds to run. You then go up here and click generate data, and then it'll output all of the new data to the new database, and you can use it to test. Uh, questions? Excellent. 
uh, yes. Uh, are you saying like you, you've made all your transformations and then someone adds a new table or a new column? Yeah, of course. Uh, so if the data doesn't contain PII that you care about, then nothing. The system will just pass it through without modifying it. But let's say it adds a new column with like an SSN, for example. Um, typically, you trigger generation jobs through our API that you like integrate with your like CI CD pipeline. Um, so in the API, you can actually do a query to see if the schema has changed since the last time you set generators on it. Uh, and then you can um, go in and add generators. But a, a best practice with us is actually everything that we did in the UI is added to like this JSON file, which like describes all of your transformations. And it's best if you check that into your source code with like your, your SQL scripts that stand up your database tables. So when someone you know, goes into the code repository, modifies a table, in the code review, they also need to modify that JSON description. And if they don't, someone should leave a code review comment saying, hey, that new column you added contains PII. Don't forget to add a new entry to the JSON file as well. So everything can stay up to date. I don't follow that question. Oh, no, it, it, every, every time you run the job, it'll regenerate everything. Uh, come talk to me afterwards. Yeah. Yes. So what size company is, it is, is our typical customer? We have companies that are um, uh, as small as probably five developers, probably, uh, up to uh, one of like, the big four accounting firms. Yeah. Yes. Sure, I'll, got it. So I, I, um, he's asking about like how scalable is this when you come across unstructured data, I, I, is essentially your question. Uh, so we do support unstructured data. I, I didn't show it in the demo, but uh, for example, like Postgres has a JSON data type, uh, and you can apply transformations to individual um, uh, key value pairs in JSON fields, or in JSON documents. Yeah. Uh, and yes. Uh, do I incorporate boundary testing for? Oh, um, so uh, I only showed you a few of the options that you can apply for the transformations, but a lot of our transformations allow you to provide inputs as to how they should operate. Uh, and that, that is, I mean, roughly what you're talking about. Uh, we'd have to talk more to really understand exactly what you're meaning though. Yes. So what differentiates us from data prep companies like Paxata? Uh, I'm not familiar with them, so I can't speak to that. But maybe you could answer if you, because you saw the demo. <laughs> it looks the same? Okay, I'll, I'll look them up. I've, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, yes. Yes. So I, I think the question is being asked, uh, how, much, uh, how much of our tool is used for HIPAA data? Um, we, we have customers in the healthcare space. Um, I don't think they're using it for exactly what you said, uh, which is, could you repeat what you said actually about that last part? So I'm, I'm not familiar with that, um, so I can't speak to it, unfortunately. Oh, my, my computer oh, went out. Anyways, before I end, we're hiring, so if you're a software engineer, come talk to me after this. But, all right, are there, are there more questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, so everything I did, in, so the question is, is, is there a way to automate changes? Because, you know, like your data schema changes all the time. How do you automate things so you're not constantly going into the UI? Is that your question? Um, everything I did in the UI, you can trigger through API calls. Uh, and that, that's typically how people, like pe people will typically like use the UI to get everything set up that first time. And then afterwards, they use the API a lot. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, we got super technical there. I like it.
I know that there are two more post-its in this room. If nobody's sitting in that chair and it's close to you, please grab it. I think there's one on that side of the room, and I think there's one in the back. You look like you don't want to pick up the post-it, but you just pointed to it. So now you win. Now you have to pick up the post-it. <laughs> yeah, you do. Come on down. All right, what can this room do for you? Maybe 20 seconds, I can tell them what I do. Is that okay? Okay, guys. My name is Farzan. Hi. Um, a big data company here in Alpharetta. Uh, everybody says big data. What is big data? We're building and deploying machine learning uh, modeling for business. Uh, boost your revenue, you know, customer segmentation. Anything with machine learning. You know, AI satellites. Thank you. I'm kind of enjoying this, like, spur of the moment pitching. And you get socks. You should come talk to him after. All right, and Hilton, I know you said I was gonna get like casual music, but I feel like we're like real casual now. Okay, okay, how are we doing up here? Okay, so we are up to our fourth presenter of the evening. Give it up for RCE. Thank you everyone for being here and thank you for the casual music because what I'm gonna tell you something is a life changer. It's something which inspired me to start this company last year, and here's the story. Now a one emergency. Yes, please help me. My husband has fallen, and he's holding his chest. I don't know what to do. I need, please come. I need your address, ma'am. This one hour that we're going to be here, 90 people would have had a heart attack. What are we doing about this? Think about it. I'm going to tell you something. 25% of people, 210,000 people every year have had heart attacks, but they've already had a heart attack before. Medicine is not preventative. Add to that, 20% of the heart attacks are silent. You can't even feel pain. My dad was one of them. Diabetic in his sleep, passed away. I didn't get a chance to tell him goodbye. Expensive process, right? Uh, heart, having a heart attack, 18% readmissions in the first 30 days. Guess what? The government does not reimburse you for that. So you lose all that money. We'll come back to that in our business model. Well, we wanted to do something about it. Uh, I was uh, inspired by my own dad's uh, loss. Uh, I had training in medical school, technology, I was doing med devices, and this is how I started. Um, the technology works in three steps. The first step is a device, a device which has two components, an ECG-based uh, product, which you see up there, Garmin, that gives live ECG data. I'm wearing one of these right here. It's a production prototype, and I had to turn off the Wi-Fi for the mic, but this is the uh, box that goes with it. Number two, we have an optical sensor that you'll see in the demo here. This is a new device which detects proteins non-invasively. So basically, no pin pricks. You don't have to be invasive. Think about all the people who are older having heart attacks and they're on blood thinners. This is really good. So excited to get our first product really out there. The first one is now lined up for clinical validation. We're super excited to be partnering with West Virginia University, 11 hospitals. Thank you. Along the way, we got a lot of people who uh, trusted in our technology, believed in us, uh, and also a hospital in India called CMC in Valor has agreed to provide us data. We started with that. We worked with MIT's open database. WVU accepted our proposal to work with their data sets to make our AI better. So what does the AI do? All this data that goes from the device into the cloud, AI learns characteristic patterns in ECG changes, and now it knows a heart attack before it happens. Now, 
once we know, as soon as the early stage of heart attack is triggered, number three, this is an app, this is a triage platform. Think of it, an optimization problem between demand and supply. Incoming patients, they need health, uh, they, 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 they need help in 40 seconds, 50 seconds, minutes ticking. This is the app that does it. So, so all that said, what does this mean? We can do this in seven minutes, okay? One minute to detect, five minutes to uh, take this out uh, to AI, make a decision, and then the last minute with a physician. We're better because in reality, it takes 55 minutes to get to a doctor. Better, we reduce invasive interventions, drive higher diagnostic value with optical sensors, protein detection. Most importantly, reduce ER visits. Huge cost savings. How do we roll to market? Two phases. FDA has two paths. We have 510K for the predicate, products complete, uh, FDA submission this summer, in the market next year. Path number two, optical sensor, new device, de novo pathway, 1,000 clinical trial patients, uh, will run for a year, will submit 2020, in the market 2021. Finally, I just wanna say, how do we make money on this? Again, coming back to that 18%. We wanna take these people back home with the device and reduce that 18% readmission to 5%. That's what hospitals will pay. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So, good question. So, Apple Watch is looking at, uh, oh, how is the optical sensor that we have designed different than the uh, Apple Watch? Apple Watch uses a technology to look at uh, different levels of oxygenation in hemoglobin, and that's how it detects, hey, here's where oxygenated blood is, deoxygenated blood. It detects heart rate based of that. We are not looking for heart rate, or we're not looking for oxygenation levels. We're looking for specific cardiac proteins, proteins released from the myocardium when you, know, you have a heart attack. Great question. So 18%. Oh, uh, the question is, who would get this? When would they get this? So 18%, that's our target. People come in the uh, hospital, have a heart attack, they're in patient monitoring. That's when we put this device on them. 18% of these people will have a heart attack in the next 30 days. High risk population, 55, 75, but that's... No. Um, the question is, does the iWatch give, in a sense, the same information as our optical sensor? The iWatch is really going after heart rate, and indirectly, you can use that information to detect rhythm of the heart, and when the rhythm of the heart is not in sync, it's arrhythmia. That's one-third of heart diseases. We're not in arrhythmias. We're looking at heart pathology. When a coronary artery is blocked, that's when the pathology starts, the heart dies. That's what we detect. The proteins leaked in the cells that don't get oxygen from blood. Uh, I, so I'm not sure what you mean by stabilize. You, you uh, sorry, I think you're asking uh, at what point would the risk reduce? You really can't heart, you can plan a vacation. You cannot plan a heart attack. My dad had a heart attack, a second heart attack after five years. He had a very high level of cholesterol. He should have had a second heart attack in his first year, so can't say, but. No. Mm -mm. We're going to spend next two to... Oh, is there a direct-to-consumer market? We're going only after SOM, 18%, bring it down to 5%, uh, three years, get data, then we'll go to consumers. Why? Because we want payers to pay for this and then make it affordable. Okay. So, uh, what is the 
Well, we're moving fast. July. Oh, uh, uh, how can uh, we help? Uh, where are we looking for help? We're moving fast. We started in July for a hardware company. It's really uh, hard and tough. We've done a great job building the product. Now we're moving fast towards FDA, clinical pilots, submissions, uh, and then going to market. So we're looking for funding. That's our biggest thing. Second thing is uh, this is a device that we've built in the U.S. and it's really great. And we want to optimize uh, distribution, marketing, um, production in the U.S. at lower cost. So if, if there are people that know that. Um, good question. So we've looked at a few things in, oh, I'm sorry. The question is, can we use this, repurpose this for other places like seizures? So the data scientist on our team, he's been a pioneer in stroke prediction using EKGs and EEGs. Yes, further down the road, yes. We're also looking at an athletics program to see if there's any value there, but not until five years. So we just want to double down med, uh, med device, get our clearance in the market, three years data, then we'll see. I, a question is, uh, do we wear this 24-7 or at night? Can I answer? Uh, this is a wearable device that is 100 machine washes. Uh, you walk into the hospital, you get put one on. Uh, when you leave the hospital, you walk out with the tote bag with two more. So you get three and you can recircle, uh, recycle these. Uh, this is machine washable up to 100 machine washes. It's got electrodes embedded into the uh, garment. Does that answer? Somewhat? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I want you all to know that I have done this. It is very hard to remember to repeat the question. I know. All right. I still have one more sticky note somewhere over here. All right. We're real relaxed here. Okay. Super oldies. All right. Who who wants to use it? Oh, I think he just put you on the spot. What can this community do for you, Christine? They do these more often. Do these more often? Oh, I like the Saints I did not plant her, but nonetheless, you do get a prize. Thank you for coming out tonight. All right. We'll do something next week or next month. I have something to do with like a prize spinning wheel in my mind. So we'll see how that goes. Don't laugh. I'm really going to do this. Um, okay, we are setting up our very last presenter here. Are we ready to go? All right. I know you've all been patient. We have saved the best for last, I hope. No pressure. Final round of applause for tonight for Trusted Sale. Thank you. Thanks very much. First of all, quick thanks and a uh, round of applause for all the other presenters. I thought everybody did a great job tonight. Um, my name is Paul Brobson. I am the founder and CEO of Trusted Sale. I'm here tonight to talk to you about how you sell or trade in your vehicle. Now, when you look at the options for trading and selling your vehicle, you have a couple of choices. Of course, if you go out to the marketplaces to sell it yourself, you're going to take the, the risk of personal and financial safety into your own hands. Um, but you will earn more. On the other hand, if you go to a dealer or a CarMax, you will go to a safe location, but you're going to earn a lot less. And how much less? Well, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We want to create the safest and most profitable way, and that's the problem we're looking to solve. So if I look at a classic example, this particular vehicle, if I trade it into the dealer, I'm going to get around $10,500. On the other hand, if I sell it privately, I can keep up to $2,600 more in my pocket. So the question is, why don't more people sell privately? And the answer that we found in our research is really three reasons. The first reason is that people are afraid, and they're afraid for good reason. They're afraid of getting scammed. They're afraid of handling cash with people they don't know. Uh, people don't know how to do it. I don't know how to sell a car. I don't know how to list it on Craigslist. I don't know what the transactions involve. I don't know the bill of sale. I don't know how to do it. And lastly, it's too much work. It takes too much time. It's, I got to put an ad in Craigslist, and then by the time I get it up there three days later, it's at the bottom of the page. And then I got tire kickers and time wasters, and it's a lot of work. But probably the one reason I wanted to bring this up tonight is this, if you can probably see the date here, this is actually yesterday in DeKalb. 
man meets teen to see car for sale is robbed at gunpoint instead. That was yesterday. You could look this up in any major city in America, you'll see this played out every day. That's why we created Trusted Sale, so people could meet safely and transact securely. We've created the first all-in-one transaction platform for people selling their vehicle privately. It combines ID verification and a secure cashless transaction. It provides transparency through a warranty and a free vehicle history report. It provides a bill of sale and instant financing to those people who need the help. We've also helped people by providing a way for them to publish their listing any marketplace they want. And finally, we are the first ever certified pre-owned program for private party vehicles. Thank you. So here's how it works. Let me tell you how it works. Um, we're not an, a mobile app. We are a web-based application that can be used on any device. We'll start by telling us a little bit about your car. You'll snap some photos. You'll get verified by taking a, a driver's license scan, front and back of your driver's license, and a selfie. Ultimately, we'll ask you to help enable payout to your bank account. And we will build you a professional selling page for your vehicle. And if you take a closer look, you'll see that this vehicle's seller has been verified. Their identity, their document, their bank, their email, their mobile phone. This is the person that they say they are. We also will provide, as I mentioned, a free vehicle history report, even the original window sticker, so you can see the manufacturer's original equipment. We'll help people get a loan if they need it. And then when it comes to promoting their vehicle, this is Facebook Marketplace. You don't even need a Facebook account to promote your vehicle through our service. We will push it out to Facebook Marketplace for you, and we won't just stop there. We'll actually promote it to over 150 other famous car, used car marketplaces in the market on your behalf. Now, any of the visitors from any of those sites will come directly back to your trusted sale page. You can contact the seller, make an opportunity to meet, when it comes time to meet, you can meet at a safe designated zone at local police departments. I actually have a friend here from AMCO, a national partner who we're working with now. You can also meet at a local AMCO. And when it comes time to make the deal, the buyer just clicks on the buy button, picks their payment method. They can pay by debit card or by ACH, and they, get, they complete the bill of sale, and then the bill of sale and receipts met, is sold to both parties. And the seller gets all the funds deposited directly into their bank we say, sell fast, make more. If you want to do that, we tell you, go to trustedcarsale.com where you can sign up for free. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? The question is, how do we make money? What is our revenue model? So our, uh, the answer is we make money on the transaction. We do charge a transaction fee to the seller. And that fee um, can vary depending on whether the funds are deposited instantly, 2.5%, or if you're willing to wait a couple of days, then it's 1.5%. We also make revenue um, on ancillary sales of warranty products, financial service packages with our lenders, and other insurance and protection products. Yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, is there a way to automatically transfer the title from one party to the next? Uh, come back in Q4 this year, and we'll be introducing that solution. Today, you have to handle the title paperwork yourself, but we're working on that solution now. It should be integrated in Q3 and piloted and nationwide available in Q4. Yes. The, the question is, are we planning to expand to more than just cars? Actually, we started... And we weren't cars. We were everything and anything. And we had all kinds of stuff come through the platform. You'd be surprised what people are selling. Legally now, everything was legal. Dental office chairs. Our next soiree will be into recreational uh, vehicles and the power sports category for the natural extension. We're also working with some partners right now in that area. So we will be RVs, ATVs, snowmobiles, boats. And then we'll pr progress to pretty much anything that any private parties want to sell to each other with values over $1,000. Question in the back. The question is, is the transaction fee the same regardless of the price of the vehicle? And the answer is yes. And we do have a $255,000 Rolls-Royce Dawn 2017 teal a color that it looks like it would be perfect for you. <laughs> <laughs>
Any other questions? Uh, the question is? The question is, we don't have a mobile app, and why not? Because I'm stubborn. Um, the answer is, we probably will. That's another thing that's on our roadmap, simply because the ability to, our, our vision for the future is that in less than five minutes, you will be able to walk around your car with this mobile app and be able to take high quality photos in and out of your car, front and back of your driver's license, selfie, and then you're done. And we'll be able to take all the rest of the pain for, away from you. But to do that would probably require a mobile app. The answer was we wanted to make sure before we went that way that we were getting high level of mobile adoption. And in the first uh, 11 weeks since we've launched, we have 74% of our users are on mobile. So now Mr. Stubborn is, <laughs> is changing his tune. <laughs> Any other questions? In the back. The, the question is, what data are we collecting and how do we plan to monetize and manage it in the future? The answer is all of it and as much as we can <laughs> to anyone that's willing to pay us for it. Um, we have actually had several relationships with um, national partnerships, both in credit unions, banks, financial service, you can imagine lenders. We've also, uh, we're part of Mercedes-Benz USA startup showcase here in Atlanta, and we're working with them as well they, uh, to monetize data. So OEMs and, and national retail partners are, are how we look to, to, to monetize the data. Yeah, one thing I wanted to just show super quick, I know I'm on questions, but I did want to mention the AMCO uh, presentation. You asked how, my, how are we, how is it able, is there a setting on our profile, is there a way for people to, as the independent car seller, to be able to do? The, the partnership with AMCO will be really helpful for that because what we're doing is we're allowing folks to go to their local AMCO center, meet with the buyer there, get the vehicle inspected, get it certified, and put a warranty on it. Of oh, answer question. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. The question is, how many users do we have in the platform, and how many vehicles have we sold? Um, currently, we have ha we have 687 vehicles on the platform since January 10th, and we've uh, transacted 37 vehicles. We have 7,900,000 in transaction value on the platform currently, and we're adding new cars at a rate of about 20 per day. Wow. All right. Can we also give him a round of applause for I didn't have to remind him to repeat the question at all. So nicely done, Paul. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We will see you the last Monday of the month in April. Thank you.